Hi everyone, welcome to the second episode of our web series titled um, The Story of Music, Capitalism and Passion. So in this second episode, we have expanded our definition of um, institutions of academia. According to the Oxford Dictionary, academia is the environment or community concerned with the pursuit of research, education and scholarship which is a space that we at Uhuru are curating through this web series. So Uhuru Heritage is an NPO co-founded by Ntutu Maharasa and I three years ago. Um, from then we have grown tremendously and we seek to continually grow with our community. 100% um, of our creative proceeds go into our small projects. We're currently working on a climate change awareness and adaptation project and desperately need funding and collaborations. If you're interested in helping us help others, please contact us through our website and social media platforms. So for this episode, our host is Ayanda Mazibugo. Some of you might remember her from our first webinar. Um, Ayanda, welcome. Um, all right. Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining Uhuru's second webinar episode. Today, we are going to dive into the story of music and more so how musicians navigate the dichotomy between passion and capitalism. iTunes, Spotify, SoundCloud, Deezer, with these brief words, one can map the landscape of, of music today. But these just aren't these, but these aren't just songs or musicians they've become brands and products, right? Um, and part of what we're trying to understand is how pervasively capitalism has shaped music over time. We're also trying to understand the politicization of music, the branding of musicians, the, the production, the distribution, and the consumption of music, especially in this digital age. Um, we're also trying to figure out the globalization of music. We're trying to figure out the spirituality of music, the gatekeeping of music, and the inaccessibility of music. You know, in some way we're trying to understand an industry that has moved from creativity to profits. And ultimately, we are going to, we're here to share the stories of those who are laboring um, to make musical meaning, you know, in the shadows of the mainstream cultural industries. So tonight we are joined by two incredibly talented and transcendental thinkers, creatives, and musicians. Bonolo Thomas, who also is known as Bose Hub. Um, who is the founder of Under Precious Sundays, which is something that everyone should jump on, and Montati Masebe, who, is, who also goes by an alias, um, who also goes by the name of Ruby Proxy. Um, but before we go any further, just as Lisa mentioned, let me introduce myself. My name is Ayanda Mazibugo, and I'll be your host for the evening. And I hope that you're as excited as I am to learn and grow in this space. As you can see, I already have my cup in hand. Um, so grab your cup of tea or your glass of wine and let's get ready to immerse ourselves um, in this musical experience and conversation. So first to present today is Bonolo. So Bonolo Thomas, aka Bozhab, is a bedroom producer and sound curator based in Johannesburg. Bonolo completed her Bachelor of Social Science degree at UCT, majoring in Gender Studies and Anthropology. Her academic passions lie in the field of anthropology because it broadens the institutional limitations of what constitutes valuable knowledge and how one goes about acquiring and generating such knowledge. While she was a student, Bonolo co-founded an online music portal, um, an online music portal that displays and um, that displays local underground and alternative music called Under Pressure Sundays. Bonolo advocates for the effective archiving and promoting of art in a way that serves our economy financially and educationally. Her interests also lie in the upliftment of the African audiovisual artist community and economy, an interest sparked by her educational background in anthropology. Whew, I know that was a mouthful, but I'm ready to hear from Bonolo. I hope you can, you are too. Um, so yeah, Bonolo, take it away. The floor is yours. Hi, everyone. Um, hello, hello, hello. I'm just going to say hi one more time and hope that you can hear me. If you can't, um, please can Ayanda or Lissaho just let me know. Cool. So my name is Bunolo Thomas and I'm going to be speaking about um, the story of music, capitalism and, 
um, passion and how it intertwines with my life. Um, so I'm just going to start off by introducing who I am and um, my influences and how I came to be the person that I currently am now. And then I'm going to move on to um, two, I'm going to highlight two ideas um, that constantly pick my brain about um, the industry um, alongside possibilities that will allow us to reimagine alternatives to these things that I'm hating on. Um, and then I'm going to leave you guys with just a couple of questions to consider. Um, they are quite random, but they kind of speak to the themes that might um, come up throughout the chats. Cool. So my personal background, um, I was raised in a very, very academic household. Um, both of my parents were very, very academic. Um, and as much as they weren't necessarily artists, they were uh, very much art lovers. Um, and although my immediate household was not necessarily musical, um, the household that my mother grew up in was quite musical because my gran is a choir conductor and she has the most beautiful voice I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> cool. Um, and in the context of academics, um, I completed my matric and then I did my A-levels and then I moved on to do my undergraduate, um, graduating with a Bachelor of Social Science um, and I majored in Anthropology and Gender Studies. Um, and artistically, um, in high school, I was very much interested in theater making and just anything to do with performance. Um, I was also, in, uh, I was part of the choir, which I really liked. Um, and in uni, um, I took it upon myself to teach myself how to make beats. And yeah, I'm a bedroom producer. And in and of that bedroom producer little wormhole, um, I discovered this cool passion of sound curating and just engaging with people like myself um, and just seeing what's out there and showing people. Cool, so the first idea I wanna to touch on is the idea of an interdisciplinary approach to one's educational and professional journey. So um, what kind of upsets me is just um, how uh, societies traditionally compartmentalize um, school subjects or um, varsity faculties or um, career industries. So um, by that, I just mean, um, yeah, I, I mean exactly what it means. Um, and in and of this idea of compartmentalization, I also think there's, a, there's an economic hierarchy that exists inside of it. So for example, if you were to take a, a chartered account, a chartered account, accountant <laughs> and you were to compare them to maybe a very, very great talented musician, um, if you were to compare their salaries, firstly, it's it's very easy to assume that the charter, the, the accountant um, will earn significantly more than the musician, or maybe not necessarily more, um, but maybe a more um, stable, long-term kind of financial income sort of contract situation. So that's what I mean by the hierarchy is that if I decide that I'm really into music and I really want to pursue it and do it with all of me, um, that in, a, in and of itself is not enough because the system is just not there for me. Um, and uh, my next point basically just speaks to the metric of what decides these systems. Um, and I think that we value um, capitalistic longevity and commodification and um, acquiring a profit and a surplus of a profit over um, our mental and spiritual and environmental well-being and just serving our immediate spaces. Cool. So what we can do about this, um, firstly, I think um, it would be cool if we could start, I'm sure we are doing this, but maybe just emphasize um, this style of like merging discourses and what you learn in like traditional institutions with general culture. And in and of that, normalizing interdisciplinary collaboration. So um, it would be really cool, for example, if um, you're given a brief for a certain assignment, and sure, you are going to be assessed by your teacher or your lecturer or whatever, but also let the general public and the general audience assess your work, like really show us what you've learned and find creative ways of getting your stuff out there instead of just keeping it in an archived library. Um, uh, and I also think it's important to um, 
start generating and regenerating learning spaces that inspire individuals across all um, industries. So it's not enough to just have typical lectures in a typical lecture space and to sit behind a desk. Let's put the musicians with the Paul, Paul, political science students and let's see what they can come up with and let's see the effects that that will bring about. Um, and uh, in terms of the metric, um, I think we should shift our metric of value to one that centers the planet and just, I don't know, en environmental longevity and mental well-being instead of just um, capitalistic um, commodification type of stuff. Um, cool. So now I'm going to just play a song that I made um, with Dave Martian. Um, and basically, the song was inspired by my one friend. Um, she's based in Zimbabwe right now. And um, it was at the time when um, things were popping in Zim, like not too long ago. And then I DM'd her on Instagram and I was like, <clears throat> yo, homie, what's up? What can we do to help? Like, yo, it's lit in the world. Please just holla what's going on. Um, and yeah, basically the song, uh, you're going to hear a person speaking and that's just the sampled response that she gave me. Cool. Essentially, we're all kind of in the conundrum where we kind of have the same questions as you. We sitting in this country are like, okay, cool, we tried to protest. You guys told us to go home. Some of us have tried to go protest, which was like, kind of go down the other streets. They were like, go on, go on, go on. So, um, you know, the internet was a shutdown, but that was what happened last year when they felt like people were testing real revolution and things like that. Um, it's a bit, I also have to just make sure like, I'm also being cautious to myself to, to, to relay certain things, but um, because you, the criminal charge that they try to charge people with, which is not really a charge, but like, it's enticing the revolution. But for them, it's a nice and value revolution. All this stuff is just it's make believe in their heads as those, you know, dictatorship and lies. But um, just kind of trying to make sure that I'm not saying anything that I don't know. I think just, it's just, it's just, just kind of trying to make sure that you know, this thing is going to be just, I don't know. I don't know. It's just, it's just about,
a funny situation. He was sending his voice notes sometimes. I'm like, Awesome. Um, so the name of that song, it's called Cuff Down by Bunola Thomas and Dave Martian. And you can find it on Under Pressure Sundays. Um, and I'm sure the hosts will drop the link to the Under Pressure Sundays page. Um, it's on the latest tape. It's called Season 7 Fin. Cool. Um, so my next idea that I'd like to touch on is just the idea of encouraging broader um, economic reform strategies that are inclusive of the art sector. So the reason why is because, like, generally speaking, um, artists die broke. Um, I think we've all heard quite a few stories of artists dying broke. And um, on that point, I'd actually, uh, I want to recommend that you watch this really cool Netflix documentary called um, The Lion's Share. Um, it speaks to the idea of music ethics. And, yeah, I think if you're interested in this kind of stuff, just watch it. It's very wild. <laughs> um, also artists on eating, um, artists that are alive in the present day, um, even very, very talented artists. Um, I don't think that they have a, a sustainable kind of stream of income. Um, and a lot of artists depend on another hustle. Uh, I don't know if I, if I should call it a side hustle or a main hustle, but a hustle that gets the bread. Um, so yeah, and we all know that streams are worth like pretty much nothing. So as much as your stats speak to how much people are engaging with you, does it reflect in your pocket? Um, so yeah, I think that overall we lack um, legislative representation in the art sector. Um, and what can we do about it? Obviously, these are just ideas that I ponder on. Um, and I think there's definitely room for more conversations around these ideas. Um, but I think um, just as a starting point, we should introduce fixed and reliable contractual work in the music sector. So things like scoring series, I mean, Netflix is very, very affluent. There's many shows, you know, and there's many, many artists. So let's let's secure those contracts and let they be long-term and sustainable. And let's think of ways to make them long-term and sustainable. Um, I think we also need to get into the habit of plugging artists to corporate gigs and government events. So yeah, it's one thing to always perform for your fans at a nice groove place and we're turning up and stuff, but but let's really integrate you into the system and and use your talents in a way that will that that it will be appreciated and knowingly even. Um, I also think we need to get into the habit of creating mentorship campaigns that encourage international um, collaboration and um, investment. Sorry, it's, I deleted it there by mistake, but the word should be and investment. Um, and lastly, I think we should have contractual integration of freelance artists in the formal corporate sector. So yeah, the same way you have a contract for your nine to five, let's think of ways in which um, different types of artists, not just musicians, audio visual artists can be integrated into already existing companies. Because as humans, we, we like to be entertained and like stimulated in different ways. So let's elevate what's already there and integrate these people into our systems. Um, so just a few takeaway questions that I'd like to leave you with. Um, and yeah, just, I mean, we don't have to answer them now. Maybe you can feel free to DM me your answer if you wanna have a conversation about it. Um, it's just random questions that I think tie into these ideas thematically. Um, so the first, okay, I'll read them all slowly. <laughs> um, do you have more than one interest? slash passion in life. If you think about how the music industry is designed and how it's evolved, who do you think it serves? And do you think this is a good or bad thing? Why? If you heard an R. Kelly song playing at a party that you were enjoying, how would you, re how would you react internally and externally and why? If you were given the opportunity to submit your matric final submission with 60% of the terms grade, as a musical project, short film, play, or essay? Would you consider the non-essay alternatives and why? Thanks. Thanks guys for tuning into the vibes. Um, I hope you enjoyed my chats and uh, feel free to hook me up personally if you want more things, if you wanna pick my brain, or if you wanna continue these types of conversations.
Ah, bonds, 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 bonds. Thank you for that. Phenomenal, insightful, thought provoking. Like, I learned a lot today. <laughs> um, I was taught. I'm so ready to unpack with you. Um, and we'll definitely drop the name of the track because I'm not sure, but I think I speak for a lot of people and I say I was having a one man dance party. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but we are going to dive deeper into your music a little bit later on. Um, but for now, we're going to move on to Muntadi and see what she has to say today. Um, so Muntadi is a classical pianist, composer, and indigenous music enthusiast. Since graduating from Vitz, she has complete she has composed for the Birmingham Royal Conservatoire, Stockholm Saxophone Quartet, Japanese Harp Violin, violin Duo, um, the Bibliothek Composers 2020, just to name a few, just to name a few. She's also done collaborative sound art for the legendary sculpture and poet Professor Piti Kantuli's Azibuyele Amasiswe in the exhibition. Montati weaves her spirituality with sound frequencies and has done a series of sound bark meditations, one of which is recently premiered in Boston as part of the Black Love series organized by Castle of Our Skins. Furthermore, Muntati will be relocating to the UK to do her masters in music composition. Her thesis will focus on music cognition, basically the merging of sound and neurology, but um, with a focus, um, but with a close look at an African indigenous music. Muntati is a fluid black woman who extends her philosophies in on life into her relationship with music. She draws inspiration from numeral cultural backgrounds and is inclined to the cross-pollination that art has stimulated throughout history. Her music is extremely versatile and she's always open to collaborating across genres and disciplines. You can find some of her works on her YouTube channel and across streaming platforms. However, that is nearly just a fraction of her abilities as an artist. Muntati, the floor is yours. People are ready. Thank you for having me, guys. I'm so excited. Oh, my God. Can you hear me? Is everybody there? Um, hello, my name is Muntati, and I'm going to be talking to you guys about a lot of things, basically career-based. Um, oh, we're having a sound issue, sorry. Is so it's good on my side. Can everybody hear me now? All right. Okay, cool. Um, hi, yes, good vibes, good time. So excited to have everybody here. I am a sound artist, like I said, and I'll go into what that entails just now. Um, I think before before doing any of that though i would really like to just give a snippet of some of the stuff that i do way better sorry my my gain was really low much better everyone can hear me now strike three fuck sorry um sorry for swearing so so like i said i'm a sound artist and i'm just going to give a little snippet of some of the stuff that i do i'm gonna use a looper and um I'm going to play this instrument, which is called Mbira, and I'll also be playing this, which is called Uhadi. So I'm just going to do a really quick loop of all the sounds together so you can just get a sense of some of the things I do before we get into a really exciting conversation. And I hope you enjoy it. Okay.
So this is basically just a small loop of a bunch of sounds put together. Um, I like to work with Mbira a lot. This would definitely grow into much more, but it's just a taste. And I'm going to end it now just so we can get into the meat of the things. Um, yeah, if anyone wants to know more about these instruments, definitely you can contact me and we'll discuss it there. Okay. Oh, shit. Right, back at it. So, I am a composer and I am a classical pianist, but, you know, in order to get to this point in my career, there were a lot of steps pre-university that one needs to go through to become the style of artist that I am. And, um, yeah, so I needed to go through a second version of music school or a second school, which is called music school. And it had eight grades, which are split into two. You have a theory division and a practical division. And basically lots of time, lots of money is dedicated um, and needed to get to a point at which you can even just audition for a university institution to learn music. And so already that should tell you that access, you know, dololo access, this is not something that is just readily available to the masses. And it, it creates, um, it creates a, a division between people who have a talent and passion for music and people who can afford to really dive deep into the craft musical instruments are expensive like there's just so much that there's so much barrier that even if you did have the passion and started not a lot of people make it to the finish line because of um, lack of entry or barriers to entry luckily though the music industry is expanded and there is lots of room for people who aren't like me and had you know the privilege to, to study music beforehand and um, the industry is still available to them because there's lots of ways that we can source music absorb music there's a lot of musical spaces it's quite a universal art form and so you know church for instance a lot of people learn their music through the church a lot of people I know someone um but Bo was talking about him previously Dave Martian like 
Jeez, play anything and within seconds he will imitate what you've played on the piano and he didn't get formal training. So there's lots of ways that you can um, learn and absorb and appreciate and be a part of the craft, even if you didn't go through the means that I had gone through. There's also um, a chat about environments, right? Like not everybody has an environment that is supportive of artistry. And so they can't, even if they have the means, they can't really trust the dreams that they have because they don't have a strong support structure. And this art industry is tough. If you don't have a support structure, it makes it difficult to really pursue your passions. Um, but the industry is, like I said, open to all, much like any industry to operate. We have our nuts and bolts. We do need lawyers. We do need accountants. We do need facilitators as well. And so I really would encourage anyone that, is in um, you know the, the industries I just mentioned previously <coughs> to consider merging and blending with artists more because like a lot of the exploitation that comes comes because we don't have immediate support structures that can build a career and so if we had lawyers at our in our range if we had accountants in our range we could make things so much easier but anyway so yeah I then enter university space and start studying things like Afro-modernism, indigenous knowledge systems, cultural cross-pollination. And I start to feel like I belong um, to, to a certain degree because yeah, sure, I'm a musician and, <coughs> sorry, excuse me, and I'm a classical pianist, but I'm also a house head of note. I love house music. I love hip hop. I'm very, my taste is quite mainstream actually. Like I, I don't just listen to Tchaikovsky and Beethoven. So what does that mean for someone like me who loves the the um, the so-called popular market but is not considered as part of that popular market? Where do I fit in? Where do I find myself? And these are the things I was starting to ask myself. And in discovering the theories about modernism, I then saw what created this divide in the first place. And that's something that I kind of want to address because it really does speak to a lot of the issues that we're facing in this moment in time. So... Um, modernism is a theory that came about in the early 1900s that was all about invoking individuality. It was one that acknowledged the past and acknowledged like history, tradition, but also accounted for the modern, also counted that despite the atrocities, here we are integrated, diaspora, spread out and definitely influencing culture. And so what does that look like for us? What does that look like for our ideologies? How can we shape our views on the world? And especially for artists, how do we express our art in a way that's authentic to our lived experience? And so everybody then went out into this free forming space where they were just like finding everything as inspiration and influence for their art. They were um, representing cultures that they don't really have close affiliations with, but really loved and really appreciated. And that's where uh, um, a bit of a rivalry came about because you had one tier of the modernist thinking theories who were like, let's just explore anything. Let's break the rules. We agree that the rules are problematic, but if we don't account for all the marginalized groups, we're going to misrepresent them in our freedom of expression. And so they broke away from the people who were like, no, we need to represent. There's not enough representation of people. We just need to, if we're not doing it right, it's fine. It'll get there. But for now, let's just represent. Let's just represent. And so you then end up with a split where you have middle brow uh, modernist theories, which is known today as like pop culture, the popular industry. And these are people who have access to numbers, but no access to economic wealth, no access to influencing change systemically. And then you have the highbrow, which is um, the highbrow, which is sophisticated intellectual institution and institutions and all um, all things vested in deep, rich knowledge acquisition, but not not in any way fueling the masses with the acquisition of knowledge available to them. Um, so yeah, you know, and if I just go back to the previous slide for two seconds, I forgot a point that I wanted to raise. To go from a place where like in Afro-modernism, for instance, jazz just plummeted when Omeria Makeba and Tate Hu, Begim Selig, when they when they went overseas, respectively the UK and, and, and America, like Miles Davis wasn't trying to hear Hugh repeating his chops. He wanted to hear Maskandi, Kwela, Marabi, all of our like 
traditional genres that we cultivated from the influences of jazz and turned into our own South African thing. That's what the world wanted to hear. And that integration just shaped really, really, really beautiful fusions of genres we know today, Afrobeats. Oh man, I can go on forever, but it was just really sad to see how this promise is broken because of this divide. And now that you have a separation between highbrow people who can influence change and want to accurately accredit various sources matched against middle brow who just wants to open the idea of access we're hitting a clash and it's not doing anything for our for our economy in retrospect because then a lot of artists who have clout and have popularity die poor because they don't have access to information about how the system of the industry functions whereas people like myself who were lucky enough and fortunate enough to go to university institutions now know the full breadth of the industry understand the different ways that you can exercise your skill set and make profit for yourself as an artist like bonola said earlier you know you need to be a hustler like you need to have multiple revenue streams but the idea that those multiple revenue streams don't exist in the music industry is flawed and false but is very 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 understandable because not everybody has access to that knowledge and this is where people like myself come in and this is where we need to do better so what i then did with this knowledge is like i went through a process of unlearning i had to accept that i'm no longer living in this bubble of being this great black queer pianist and and doing my job by making equal representation just by being a black queer and i understood that i need to do more than that i understood that the representation of me isn't doing enough it's not redistributing wealth and that's what we need you know that's 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 at least my agenda um so i recognized the problems that we have i honored my privilege and then thought all right what can i do with this privilege how can i internalize this privilege and i think that kind of takes us now into my plans <laughs> as an artist um and the little ways that i can make a change and i hope that even from what i'm saying you know we can just push the conversation slightly further from problem identification to tangible solution finding tangible in a sense that like how can you in your small capacity use your knowledge your you know how can you create learning environments that may not be formalized but can create can build access how can we build economies for ourselves like well, how, how do we have those type of conversations and so just to take it back to me <laughs> um i i then fell into the pool of sound arts which is really a space where artists can curate conversations environments and use sound as their muse but integrate that sound with multiple fields i could work with architectures i could work with ecologists um one of my mentors just did a series working with a ferment sound artist i mean you, you know you can really just you can really expand your revenue in terms of what dialogue you want to bring to the conversation and how you want to use art to bring out that dialogue as well so i could do that on the one end there's also a digital archive that i'm working on which it will be falling into my master's um project which is essentially reigniting indigenous knowledge that was like lost and i'll get into the why's just now and yeah like formulating um a a kind of <clears throat> expansion from archives from them just being stagnant and boring and something that we look at because it looks cute to something that is like really really tangible active part of the implementation of change let the archive live and breathe under pressure sundays is a form of archive it's living it's breathing and it's documenting artists who otherwise would fall into the ether if we didn't have a space a curational space for this and so um what other archive would be as well other art hub would be as a space where um you interact with these instruments not just as a divorced thing but as something that you can really like benefit your day to day and then lastly social currency man i i definitely just want to take all the knowledge i have and throw it out over the hills everywhere open it up get more artists included and part of conversations about intellectual property and 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 so i'm definitely that guy i wish there were more of guys like me who were willing to dedicate time to it, like telling people about um the nuts and bolts of the industry but yeah there's just those are the few ways that i am trying at least um but now i just want to end off by speaking about my masters thesis and um so i would be going to birmingham university to study music cognition why am i going to the uk to study something 
that involves African indigenous instruments. Muntati, are you a sellout? What's going on? Yeah, um, <laughs> the only reason why I'm doing this in the UK and not here is because um, music cognition is a study that that looks at the relativity and, and, and how um, the brain and music relates, both as a system and also like sound pitch frequencies, how just a pitch of a sound triggers into different areas of your brain and affects how the brain operates. It's a really interesting study that's just come about, but um, South Africa does not take mental health issues seriously for insofar as the people I would like this to target. Um, as you can see here, the last time stats were quantified was 2002 to 2004. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of people who don't have the same in the same ways that there's no access to learning music. There's no access to mental health treatment. There may be support structures, like in the rural areas, there's support structures and church groups, there's support structures, but support isn't what's needed to solve mental health crises. You need treatment and that treatment is expensive and that treatment is classist and that treatment does not consider the majority. What does consider the majority? Systems that existed before sound therapy. Sound therapy traces back to all sorts of indigenous practices from all over the world. Sound therapy is a form of treatment and healing that has been used in societies. But when missionaries came specifically to Africa, it was one of the things that needed to be abolished. It's one of the things that were encouraged as evil and bad and mahete and ni, you know. So a lot of people with this knowledge, a lot of people with the ability to work with sound art and sound healing went into hiding if they were not killed. You know, they couldn't speak in, in Zimbabwe, many Fikiro can't even openly say that that's what they, well, couldn't back then, openly say that's what they were because they would have been killed. And so, um, yeah, it's quite wild. I mean, guys, in, in 1981, only in 1981 did it become legal to be a Sangoma, for instance. So we really are working with a lot of um, stats that I don't want to keep throwing your way. But um, yeah, I just thought that, okay, so this is how I can make a slight difference. I'm fortunate enough to come from a very suburban background, but also very rural, and in those spaces, sound healing is normalized. In those spaces, working with multiple indigenous instruments as a function and not just a form of entertainment is normalized as well. And so when I read up about music cognition as this great discovery from, you know, Western medicine, um, it was quite laughable, honestly, that this is considered a discovery when it's been happening for centuries. Um, but I don't want to be bitter. <laughs> I don't want to be spicy. What I will say is that I would really like to introduce sound therapy to the music cognition spaces. Music cognition is not anything that can be studied as a master's in South Africa right now in the same severity as it could in Birmingham. And that's why I'm going there. But the plan is definitely to return with more resources, more qualifications that can back my chat and just open up the pool to providing access to people in a tangible way, in an applicable way, sound therapy, to build these instruments. It doesn't even cost more than 100 Rand to build these instruments, Uadi, for instance, but what it can do for your mind if you just create a healthy practice with it is unimaginable. And I hope you can continue that conversation later um, in the Q&A. Thank you so much for listening to me. And yeah, um, again, if you have any more questions, I'm your girl. Bonol is your girl. Super excited to get into the next phase of this presentation. Ah, Montati, what a beautifully layered and stimulating presentation. Um, I can safely say learning is definitely the word of the day. Um, I saw people asking, what instrument is that, you know? <laughs> and what makes it so sad is that, you know, it's instruments that come from our backyard, right? Yeah. And yeah. there's just so much we don't know about. Um, but yeah, thank you for sharing. Between you and Bonolo, there's so much to unpack. The spirituality of music, the the archiving of music, music as a healer, music as a form of protest and resistance. Um, but for now, let me take it back to, to, to our theme, right? Capitalism versus passion, passion versus capitalism, you know, in, in trying to figure out what are the ins and outs and ebbs and flows of, you know, pursuing your musical aspirations and ambitions versus, versus attaining your capitalistic desires. And I just thought, 
And to everyone that's tuned in, please continue coming with the questions. Your questions are the ones. Um, I'll actually start with um, Lishwa Honolo and Rovu's question to kickstart this conversation because I think it's what inspired the chat. So um, the question was addressed to Bose Hub, but um, if you don't mind, can we just open it up to the floor so that everyone can engage? Um, and Lishwa Honolo is asking Bose Hub, well, to everyone now, do you have any advice from your own life um, for young African musicians or artists, specifically on how to find the balance of creating art and also achieving financial independence? Um, yeah, I hope you can hear me. Yep. Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, I think as much as it's, it's burdensome to like kind of spread myself thin and force issues to do what I love, um, it's also nice to have that luxury to do what I love without um, other pressure. So it also just gives me the luxury to, like, when I do have the time to do what I want to do, I must utilize that time. What is it? What's been bothering me? What I need to use this time. And usually, when I'm under pressure, I come up with like, just like my my personal breakthroughs. So the advice that I can say is that just be responsible, financially responsible with your long term decisions. Um, because if you really are passionate about something, it's not going to run away. It, it's it's basically a part of you. So rather nurture that artistic self outside of the context of capitalism. I know it's ironic, um, like based on what I was speaking about, but I feel like a free artist um, because I have a nine to five. And when I make stuff, there's no pressure of what other people think. It's more about, ooh, I have this cool conceptual idea. Let's make sure we execute. Let's push our deadline because I'm drowning at the moment, you know? Let's actually change the idea and do it like this and do it that way because there's no pressure. The stakes are like, it's all on me. Um, so just stay true to like what you're trying to do and do your, your ideas justice. Rather do that. Sacrifice the time. If you need to work a long job to, to have a say the way that you believe you should, then do it because like, life right? you know, yeah. yeah i was just gonna say uh, in addition to that i'm so glad that you, you you pointed it the way that you did can everybody hear me still yes yes, yes? okay i think what i want to add um for for artists who are like active artists um number one you should be a company and not an individual why your taxes are ridiculously lower when you are a company and also what you're doing is you, like it may be a company of one but it's still a company so i would urge artists to really take registering their work and registering themselves as a company seriously because also it comes with returns and like a lot of the time you don't reach the criteria of people who tax so all the money you pay to tax comes back like really 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 um that's the one thing the second thing i'm so sorry that this is very capitalist and very like money 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 but it's just uh, yeah um the second thing i would say um is when you what you charge what you charge for gigs for anything for any of your time for any of your interview anything think in three months do not think in one month because you are a freelancer that's if you are freelancing like myself we can't rate we can't charge because we're thinking of our expenses now we need to times all of our expenses by three so that when month two comes and you're not getting money you still have a little bit left over from month one do not be shy about charging what you think you are worth. There's this thing, because we're always getting paid in exposure, there's this thing that artists do where we're like, okay, you know, um, hey, how much do you have? But what's your rate? How much do you have? Or, or, or what, you know, what can we do? Let's talk. I think that level of negotiation needs to end, needs to stop, because we are the most exploited at the end of the day. What we bring to the table has a higher return than what we are given. So let's put ourselves first. Let's put our livelihoods first times everything by three when you Can I just break. add to that, though? Um, I also think that in terms of, like, negotiating a rate, a rate, to some degree, like, we should negotiate. So, for example, when I think of the context of Under Pressure Sundays, I put in a lot of work to kind of archive and curate in a way that's palatable to our potential listeners, right? 
But when it comes to hosting an event, I literally have to think way long term and take racks from my pocket, literally. Otherwise, I can't do it because of my reputation. Wow, now I'm that person that doesn't pay artists. But in and of that, even when I do finally get the racks, I know that I'm going to pay artists what I, like if I think of my desired ultimate rate, I know I'm not going to reach there because of my mm. means and my capacity. But in the same light, if, if, if I book the specific artist it's because I vibe with you, I want to expose you to people, please send us content for the season. So there is a bit of negotiation. I'm not just bothering you, using you without context to like your goldenness and then just lathering you in the dustbin. So yeah. I also, um, I think we must be, we must always contextualize what platform yeah. is hitting you up. And even in my chat, that's why I'm saying we really need to integrate artists into like these corporate systems of thinking. Because that's where the racks are at. And that's where you like, not dog, pay me 10K for five minutes or another, you know? And mm. it's, it's literally Vodacom, so they can't because you're giving them a fire song, you know? Um, I love that you said that, that distinction, yeah. because like you may not be able to pay as high as a Vodacom, but the social currency that comes with Under Pressure Sundays is big. And also you building relationships with these artists. So you and the artist in, in, in some form are now conjoining, whereas like a corporate setting, they are trying to use. So if they're just trying to use you, yeah, go for it. I really yeah. love that you made that distinction. Yeah. That's fair, that's fair, that's fair, that's fair. Um, in, you know, in negotiating, right? Like I wanna know at the expense of what, right? Because I'm trying to tie in a lot of what you said. So at some point you said you feel like a sellout, <laughs> um, <laughs> which, which, which really interests me, right? So even in this negotiating um, for, for grades and negotiating for your own craft, right? And for your own, because you're a product, you're a brand, right? that's what you see in this capitalist society. Um, yeah, how far are you willing to go um, to be successful or to what degree do you feel like you're selling your soul in that? Um, what separations have you made within yourself or compartmentalizations yeah. have you made within yourself? And maybe to help other artists who are so deep within their music but obviously have to survive, right? Um, so I think this also brings us back to what I was saying in my talk about middle brow and high brow. And the, the the form when I was questioning whether I'm a sellout or not is because of how like how mainstream I am as a consumer and a lover, but how higher art I am as a artist and as like a functioner in 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 the industry. But like just to answer you, I I grew up in the arts. My mom is an actor, so I'm I'm not new to the freelancing ups and downs. So I do think that I am not only speaking from a point of um, where we are at. I'm speaking from upbringing. I like yeah. feast or famine. It's 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 not been a steady slope, and I can definitely draw references from the times where I could see why money went where it went and why we were as low as we were or why we were as high as we were. I think yeah. then when it comes to the idea of negotiating. Um, like Bonolo was saying, it's 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 more about context, like definitely contextualize, but your soul where you stand, ah, oh, it's such a tough question, man. I don't consider myself a brand. I know we have to do the brand thing. I really don't like thinking of mm -hmm. art as a brand, and I don't like I don't like that. I do like the idea of it as a business, though, because I think a brand is still something that is pleasing. What would be the difference? For me, a brand is someone that is looking at an outer scope for validation and qualification. The brand is according to a standard. A business is your standard. It's your, you know, you determine where your soul invests in and doesn't. You can decide this is not for me. So when I meet another brand it's a brand that needs my business like i'm not i'm 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 definitely not just a marketing division in a whole yeah. ecosystem i'm the ecosystem like you know <laughs> so we actually have a question on that on talking about music ecosystem is from mandy alexander she's they are asking sorry how do we get consumers of music and dancers on the dance floor to understand their role in the south african music ecosystem yeah. <laughs> 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 I 
Yeah, would need elaboration that you asked the, <laughs> the layered question. Um, I think how I, feel I like, oh, you feel like I feel like more. I think follow your artists firstly. Mm. I think build social media relationships with those artists and don't be shy to ask them, is Spotify working for you? I want I want Bonds to speak about the Spotify chat because I think like it, it ties into you know what she was saying in her in her presentation. But yeah, um right now we are perpetuating systems that have divided wealth from clout. That's what's happening. And where mm. we think we are feeding artists, we are feeding the clout of artists. And it's not going to them generationally. Like it's not, it's not really building like long-term relationships so that the artist can remember also that when we want to I like I'm not I'm not saying I'm a shark that's trying to like become you know a millionaire. I want the piece to make arts without worrying about what I'm gonna eat, yo. Like I mm. want the piece of making more art and bringing more beauty to the world. So um yeah, but I, I think we'll come through, baby girl. Um yeah, so I think that that actually kind of has nothing to do with the consumer. Consumer consumer. Um so for example, you know that Netflix talkie about how Instagram is a lie and we're all just fake. Like mm. it's, it's just wow, life is a lie. Yeah. Yeah. So that docky just showed to me how we really are just a product of something that was already thought of. And mm. I think I, I really like idolize artists in the sense that they can like shift, they can evoke something. And mm. if you look at <clears throat> corporate businesses and already existing systems, that's where the money's at. So, <clears throat> sorry. Um, mm. Like in my previous presentation, I think we need to start thinking about like creating campaigns and um, I don't know, initiatives or projects where you get like a handful of amazing artists and a handful mm. of amazing intellects and a handful of amazing this, this, that, that, that. And let's see what we're going to come up with because I can use FL Studios and Ableton and I can align with what you were speaking about in the last um, episode, Ayanda, like where I'm like, oh, girl, yeah, you know, I learned that too. But mm. I have stage fright and I can't really speak like you. So let me record you and let's just, you know, let's just do something cool where you can get your chat out there because I can get ears, you know, um, and also interdisciplinary stuff. So I think that it's, the work is more in the artists and the institutions that exist. Consumers must chillax and do the most. And unfortunately, your Steve Jobses and your Spotify peeps have made it really difficult to think of a sustainable kind of method, but we, we, we working on it, you know? So yeah, it's like, let, let the consumers enjoy, right? You know, when you're hosting a party, like you want your guests to really enjoy. And like, if they have an issue, Please go get them a drink. No, you spoke a drink. Don't worry, I'll wipe it. Are you good? You know, that kind of energy we surveyed the world. And I love that. I love people that. enjoy. Yeah. yeah. I'm ready to be a forever consumer in that regard. Heart. <laughs> um, <laughs> heart. Um, yeah, I love that. I love that you're also speaking about like a really important thing, which you both touched on in your presentations, but the cross um interdisciplinary work that needs to happen to actually like push the narratives that we should be pushing, right? And we should be propelling. And on that, on that like consumption of music, right? Like, do you guys think that Africa as a whole or South Africa is is ready for the type of music that you guys are are making and more so like the narratives associated with it? And if not, like what will make them ready? What do we do? Like what, yeah, what do we do? Uh, I don't mind going. Sorry. Yeah. yeah, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, Bonds. Um, I don't think it really matters what, like, it doesn't really matter. So, like, um, I always have this chat, like, when I have, like, personal snob conversations with people. I always be like, as an artist, are you trying to be Beyonce? Are you trying to make it? Or are you trying to do something with your work? Like, if you're trying to make it and if you're trying to be Beyonce, then you will be miserable and you will have to bend over backwards and have this like online presence that will fuck with your mental health and whatever. But if you want to opt for like being a wholesome artist and maybe healing yourself, maybe your work will heal other people. Maybe it's just two people or, um, I actually forgot the question, um, sorry. 
No, it's okay. We continue. This is like leading us. Uh, do you mind? Sorry, can you just like no, no, back? Problem. no problem. I'll even move to another one, but it was basically just on the consumption of like music and if if people the music that you and Montetti are specifically making. Um, have you ever? Yeah, because I'm really intrigued by this. You know, you're producing this music for someone to listen, right? And have you ever, um, um, you know, tripped over your head or is is my country, is my continent ready to listen to this? You know. And this narrative that I'm pushing, or you know, even how do I how do I expand that narrative? Um, I think I I also agree with Bonolo in that like yeah. it shouldn't necessarily be about what the maximum reach can be or is, mm -hmm. uh, especially because of how how decentralized streaming has made music as well. Like the the the, the outreach is big. And it, it does depend on what you're bringing to the table. If you're trying to be a pop artist, your goal is getting signed by the shocks of the industry. And just, yeah, that, that, that for me looks like selling my soul. But for someone else, not being famous is selling their souls. And so I think we should always open uh, room for diversity in the industry. We're not all looking for the same things. And that's what makes it so beautiful is that we can, we can come at it differently for some people it can be a hobby that doesn't make you less of an artist as me who spent the last 17 years you know like learning about this one specific thing and then also just bringing it back to me I think music as a function so the things I want to do with sound healing and sound therapy I would love for that to be readily accessible to many rural villages many um, urban townships, many places where people don't have access to mental health. So that, I will be a shock. That is how I will be Beyonce because I really feel like it's important that mm -hmm. sound healing kind of thing. But me, Montati, Ruby Poxy, all those other things, like uh, I'm chilling. That is not where I'm trying to like bring toxicity, you know? Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, mm -hmm. that, that's how I'd make the distinction for myself. Also um, like, uh, sorry, just to add to that, um, even the artists that are like Beyonce famous, we can't discount how impactful they are. So yes. I think when we started, I mean, sure, there was a plan to get them to where they were, but there is so much honesty in their art, which is why they are reaching, right? So mm -hmm. if, if you start with, I want to I wanna be there, then it's like, just come back to like, what, what, what are you saying to us? What do you want to say to us? What like, drives you? Yeah. Day, what, what's your project about? And are we actually interested, you know? And if we're not, doesn't matter, continue yeah. doing you. Um, yeah, that's nice. Mm -hmm. Fair, fair chats, Bob. I hear you. <laughs> fully. Um, I actually have a question for you from Dr. Maharaswa. And it says, hi, Bonolo. How have young artists um, endeavored to collaborate and be mentored veterans in the industry? Sorry, please so, repeat that question. Yeah, yeah, I'll repeat it. How have mm -hmm. young artists endeavored to collaborate and be mentored, um, I think it was like, be mentored by veterans in the industry? Mm -hmm. So I think just talking about the relation between young artists and mm -hmm. veterans. Yeah. Okay. I think that, I think in any industry, because uh, when I have conversations about people in different industries, it's similar. Um, I think that as you age, you have a lot of wisdom, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you must be center stage calling the shots. Mm. So I think that you can be very much a legend, having impacted the space, having paved the way for people and inspired people. And you don't have to always come up with a plan F to be relevant again. You can mm. kind of find us. You know, come to our shows and give us your plugs and stuff. Yeah. And that's what I mean by mentors. Like, do you know how many times I've Googled all of these um, these these people that have these events or these like very affluent um, local artists just to find their email, just to try and maybe just show you that like, wow, you inspired me and maybe just can you show me a little bit of something. So hard because everyone is still about their shit about yeah. them going global yeah africa's now that is cool but it's you now because you're not you're not yeah. here you're not, you're not funding us bro like seriously we don't even have rights we're nine to five and stuff yeah. so i think that the older folk who have changed the game need to first of all just 
They need to share their resources. They mm. need to come to our shows. They need to listen to our music. They need to post it on their social media. They need to host activations. I know brands and stuff do that, but brands do it with a with an ulterior motive. So let's get like that coffee, for example, just having a cool little, uh, you know, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory vibes. Like, oh, you, you, you. Okay, guys, you guys got the chocolate. You just go in, you know. Um, right. and I know Red Bull does it for like Berlin things, but like what? They choose half a person from like a whole, not a whole. Sorry, that, I'm not trying to sound rude, but they choose someone that's like, just the mm -hmm. one person, you know, in a whole space. So let's do yeah. it ourselves and let's let's connect and show. Like I'm sure AKA, AKA and Casper have stuff to say, you know, they might not align, but they might have stuff to say. Like tell mm -hmm. us, inspire us. So, I think mm -hmm. I just want to add to that, that like the idea of mentorship should start extending the face of, of artists. Cause right now, like, Mm -hmm. Like when I saw that question, my first go to was exactly like Bonds was saying, you know, I bought black coffee, the, the main guys that are out there, but those guys have teams. And mm -hmm. I think we should be getting mentored as young artists because I understand that like mm -hmm. 10 years ago, it made sense to be part of an establishment mm -hmm. where you have a team of 10 people building your, your music and building your career with you right now. Most singers are also their own producers, are also their own studios in their bedroom. Mm -hmm. And so we need to be learning those type of skills from whoever's readily accessible. I can say, like, the people I consider mentors, I consider Dave a mentor. I consider Shane Cooper a mentor. Mm -hmm. I consider people who maybe aren't known by the masses, but there's things mm -hmm. that they do that I like and I've learned from them by just sitting in a room with them while they're making beats. I've learned more about production. I've learned. So figure mm -hmm. out like what is it that you want to learn and really look for who's there. Because yeah, Black Coffee probably won't want to speak to you. There's so many Black composers in this industry who I've reached out to mm -hmm. as a young composer asking, you know, sending through portfolio and stuff and they've given me the boot. But they there's more, there's, there's more than just that operating in the industry. And there's people who have been in the industry for years. And I, there's people who, there's people like Gavin, there's people like Adam Howe, there's people who really, really, really work so hard on trying to create um, a learning narrative. Spaces like the Center for the Less Good Idea as well. It's a mm -hmm. center by William Kentridge, which really immerses itself in like learning, ulterior, black like, based learning environments, failure culture, process-based learning, as opposed to like rule-based learning. And yeah, I think just um, if we just knew more about those type of spaces and tried to replicate those same spaces, we'll be fine. We don't need the big stars if they don't want us. They don't want us. They money though. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Like, that question, guys, like, it just shows that a bigger conversation needs to be had between like, yeah, relationship between young artists and mentors and like, how do we bridge that, right? And like seeing there's ageism in the industry, there's like elitism within the industry, and already it's a tight corner, man. The industry is closed. So, you know, fair, 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 fair and valid points across the board. And I feel as if if we had someone from another, if this was an intergenerational conversation, we'd be hearing something different, right? So yeah, I think that's like something to pick in terms of, yeah, how do we how do we move forward? Um, yeah, in terms of the Moving right along, um, we have a question from Rabs, a major fan. Um, he's asking, what do you think needs to change in order to avoid the constant situation where we find artists dying broke? Whose responsibility is it to deal with this? Um, I'm going to just off the cuff say we need to be building our own ecosystems as artists. Um so I spent 2019, all of 2019, working for Samro, which is um, the place that collects royalties for artists. I'm not going to mm -hmm. spill any beans on that front, but what I, but one thing that I will raise as a fact is that um, South Africa is built off oligopolies. Oligopolies are a big thing in in our country. What that means is, um, when you think of a food franchise, when you think of where to buy food, check us, Woolworths, Shoprite. If you think of clothes, it's the price, uh, you know, <coughs> pick and pay. When you think of artists, AKA Casper, like we, we, we stop at like one space yeah. 
And mm. so um, what's that then created is an assumption that like in the music industry, the only way you can get your royalties is if you register with Samro. The only way you can get your song on radio is if you're signed to Sony. Not true, not true, um, but not spoken of enough and, and, and not enough people are implementers. So I think we need more implementers. There is a big unemployment rate in law fields, in accounting fields, those there's a lot of people with degrees and skill sets, but they didn't make it into the top firms and they feel like they have no other plan. They feel like there's nowhere to go. We need more, we need more um mediate not mediators, what do y'all call it? Facilitators, maybe we need more facilitators. We need a law graduate being like, okay, all my friends are musicians. Instead of striving for this dream, I'm gonna become a lawyer for all of these guys and when they make it so will i like i think that's what we need more small um manageable silos of people building like indie label type style things and building an economy that then expands and expands together collectively mm -hmm. um i don't know if you guys know <coughs> sorry one more thing i don't know if you guys know shane eagle's story man but like shane eagle was not signed He's an international artist. He's not signed. Maybe he is now. Um, I, I haven't been following him lately. But it was him and three friends who decided. Mm. One of the friends decided to do the education thing, studied at ASC, learned how to, you know, be the producer, Scooby. Other ones like, I'm going to do promotions. I'm going to do merch things. I'm going to do. He was like, I'm just going to keep this, like, writing, 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 writing. And a team of three world-class artists, right? Like, it is, it is possible. For us mm. to do it it's just that we look at the way we look at the systems that exist and put that as the benchmark and the only thing that it, that can get you anyway mm. Ozhab, do you want to like add on to that anything yes um i think we need to maybe just shift how we see art like how we define artists so i mean i really love making beats like genuinely but i have i have no intentions of like popping off as a singer producer in the middle of Coachella you know I I but I want to I want to like kind of do this kind of stuff and collaborate with people and, and sit in in conversations where I record them and like sample them so anyways sorry my point is that um if we think about being an artist and a musician in the context of like show business then I genuinely don't know how to answer that question yet Mm -hmm. um, we must really ask it, but I genuinely don't know how because there's things back at the ranch that I, I wish I knew, like what's going on, you know? Mm -hmm. But if we were to reimagine the art industry, Let's do it. so for example, design a soundtrack for the show, you know? Um, and you obviously gonna get the now Samuro royalties every single time there's an episode and there's a contract that says that this show is gonna air here, here. So you are inside the contract financially. And even though you're doing that, now you have to go and do something else kind of sonically related. Um, I also think like performing live is, is, is a really, really important thing that we need to preserve, even though we're in the technological age because um, there's something about like connecting with an artist in real life and singing with people. And, you know, I think there's a spiritual thing that goes on there. Um, so yeah, I think we just need to reimagine what it means to be an artist and like the expectation for yourself in your career and which pies you can dip your finger into. If you're trying to really just be AKA, I'm not sure, right? I'm really not sure if you're going to be the one, maybe you are, but who am I to say, I'm not sure. But if you want to challenge, if you want to be design an advert song, and then you know, or if you if you want to do things that are outside of the norm but speaks to your skill set, um, then I think that we can start reimagining ways in which we can eat and have we can feed ourselves and not die broke. Um, I know that with brands, we do campaigns now where you must wear Levi's and then show an Insta story of you wearing Levi's, and then that is, but. Okay. Um, that I don't think that's sustainable. And I think that that just speaks to like the ills of branding and stuff. I'm not hating on the art. I'm just saying like from the artist's perspective, you're kind of playing chess, though. you also have to eat. Um, so yeah, like just integrate artists into like teams, like the, the film team, the TV team, who's gonna do this? And like, okay, the next season, this is our guy. So, you know, what's your idea this time? Like, 
Yeah. yeah. So I don't think we should, it should just be a party. And like in that context, I'm not sure. In the context of like just channel over stuff, I'm not sure. And but also, let's just even what you were saying about like um, film. While we are young upcoming artists, they are young upcoming filmmakers, they are young upcoming. Networking is so important. Collaborating is so important. And collaborating and networking means more than, you know, following people. And it means more than, it means actually being active in the scenes mm -hmm. where there are lots of young artists. So know, know, the, know the spots, know where people come together um, to share their stuff. Poetry needs mm -hmm. lots of music. Mm -hmm. Theater. Theater mm. shows have a company yeah, of yeah. music, and you can, you know, so yeah, um, I really love what you said there, Bonolo. Guys, we almost, I'm so, even, I'm so sad to even get to this point, but we've run out of time. We're running out of time. Um, so we're going to wrap it up real soon, just with a series of questions that um, imagine maybe we'll, you know, um, Pop a stream about the future of music. And one of those questions that actually you know helps us do this is from Alan de Pitolesi. Um, you know, he asks, he's like, as an independent artist, do you see as independent artists, do you see yourselves as role models for others such as yourselves? If not, who are the pathfinders that you look for inspiration locally or globally? Um, um, yeah. okay. um we could start with <laughs> <laughs> Should I start? <laughs> um, okay. Uh, as an independent, do you see yourself as a role model? Um, not yet. Only because I think it. I can only call myself a role model when I have the means to inspire people and and do like when I can mentor someone in a tangible way. Only then will I consider myself um, a role model. But it is it is a goal to get to a point where, you know, more more kids know that they can they can do what i did um or what i'm doing pathfinders i think i kind of mentioned it earlier i think it's split into different realms like on the one end there's um me as a classical pianist which won't die and so i have my muses they're all dead um some of them are still alive but yeah so 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 i have like people from different eras who were also radical people like Sati, Eric Sati, put his middle, middle finger up to the conservatoire that he was playing at because he was like, actually, yeah, but he is the reason why music in film sounds the way it does now. He pioneered film music quite, quite extensively. So I, I draw inspiration from someone like him who was quite radical in a small but big way. I draw the same amount of inspiration from artists who are alive now i consider what bonolo's doing super inspirational i'm such a fan of her work i'm such a fan of dave marshall i'm such a fan of yeah. shane cooper i'm such a fan of ceo i'm such a fan of state true sounds i'm such a fan of house of music i'm such a fan of like that entire era all the people thank you Zul candy i don't know if i'd be alive without you like it 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 really i think music functions in various ways so to answer that is like gonna take long <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, in terms of me seeing myself as a role model, wow, I, I don't know, <laughs> kidding. Um, I, I mean, I've gotten really great feedback about what I do. Um, really, really beautiful words that I, like, I still can't believe, like, that text was typed for me. Um, but I guess to answer this question, I think to young women like myself, yes, um, yeah. So I'm not trying to be like, woo, everybody, you know what? I'm a, uh -huh. But mm -hmm. if I if if a young girl that's just like me kind of stumbles across me and what I do, I will. And if they even like whisper like beats, I will be that going <laughs> on to you. Know? Um, because I, I wasn't really afforded that kind of like um privilege. Like for me, it was a very self thing with like friends who just helped me and I here and there. So in terms of like pushing women to like immerse themselves in like the beat making space, and I mean I guess all arts, but because beat making is so dear to me, and I, I, I'm starting to master the technicalities, I would love to push women, <clears throat> black women, um, to do that because we are dope and uh, we are out here, and even though we're not typically seen as producers, we are. Um, mm -hmm. So hit me up if you're into this stuff. I'm not sure if I can help you, but I can definitely give you as much as I can, yeah. Mm -hmm.
Mm. Amazing, 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 guys. Yeah. There's so many more questions to fire and power through. Um, just go junkie. We see you. Trust me, we see you. <laughs> but we have run out of time. But I'll just read it out. And maybe what we can do is engage on Instagram. So um, the YouTube live will be shut down. But I think we could still, like, just answer those questions and post them on Instagram and still continue the conversation beyond this platform. Um, so Disco Junkie question reads, how do we incorporate the notion that for Africans, music isn't only entertainment, but survival or a way of life, right? And I think that is, that, that in itself is so episode, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so Disco Junkie will be engaging with that on Instagram, um, for sure, for sure, for sure. Um, and another, um, yeah, another question that was missed out on is, Okay, Disco Junkie telling Tati, you ain't a sellout. Any indigenous knowledge or systems that we can incorporate in music? Do you know of any indigenous knowledge or systems that we can incorporate in music today? And I think we can also like answer that offline. Um, and then um, uh, another question by Mandy Alexandra reads, the idea of paying Jews in the music industries, do you think this has changed? Mm -hmm. Um, is it a real thing or just soft language for gatekeeping? Hmm. Hey, love and that. A to keep, <laughs> and a way to keep young artists from building their career. Fair, 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 fair question that needs answers. Another question from our Deputiles we will engage with on Instagram is it's a question for Muntati. Um, what are the possibilities for ways in which music? cognition or psychology can be used to change the ways in which we relate to each other as a society. Mm. Um, mm. Yeah, so we've got a plethora of questions that we'll still engage with. Um, thank you to everyone for tuning in um, to our panelists. I've, I've got more questions for you, which I guess we'll deal with offline, which um, speak to the future of your music. Um, yeah, what do your future music careers look like? You know, I think everyone needs to know that. Um, and um, just your, your links, your handles. So if you can drop me your handles, um, we're gonna start with you and move over to Muntati. Where can people find you? Okay, I'm um, everywhere. My name and surname, Bunola Thomas, Instagram, um, SoundCloud. My name is Bonds on SoundCloud, but it's me. And Twitter, um, I'm not like, like a, a, an artist, artist like yo, yo, art, art. So if you interact with those, handles you'll see more of my personality and just like normal me which is not a problem like i'm still you know the art me um and then under pressure sundays on soundcloud under push uh u-n-d-e-r-p-h-e-r-e-s-a -E -E um on twitter and instagram and yeah man you can go in there and find more things if you want more things mm -hmm. Yes. Um, also, name and surname, Muntati um, Masebe. I think you'll find a whole bunch of various avenues. I am. I have a YouTube page with a few sound bath meditations and like random stuff. I'm not really good at like branding and shaping myself, so this is a bit hard. Um, but yeah, Instagram. I'm quite active there, Muntati underscore M. You'll find lots of random piano stuff and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> more stuff <laughs> um thank you guys i was lovely being your host i am going to give it up to the co-founder of who heritage Scruffy, um to wrap this up officially we've been doing many wrap-ups now she's going to do the official wrap-up but for me it was lovely till next time thanks ayanda you actually made my life so easy <laughs> with my job <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, no, but on a serious note, um, Uhura Heritage would like to say such a big thank you to Bonola and Montati. Uh, I can't believe how knowledgeable you are. And I, I know, like, we knew how knowledgeable you are, but hearing it, um, the fact that you're willing to share that knowledge is, yo, we're so grateful, but also so inspired because you're following your passions and not just one as we heard um, <laughs> quite a few of them um, in different avenues, but also you're really trying to make a difference in the space that you're in. And I think that's what these kind of platforms are about. Um, sharing knowledge and um, making a difference where we can, however we can. Um, so really it doesn't go unappreciated. We thank you. And it was such a treat, like <laughs> your music is so dope. 
So hearing Bonola's song, Montati, hearing you play live, hearing that beautiful voice, it was honestly such a treat. So thank you, thank you so much. Um, Ayanda, to you as well. You are the hostess with the most, you did such a great job facilitating. <laughs> Pleasure, both the webinar and the discussions. Um, so you're a star, thank you, thank you so much. And then, yo, you know me and my thank yous, I can go on. So <laughs> I will try to keep it as concise as possible. Um, but you know, we can't have a webinar um, without thanking everyone that participated, everyone that commented, just everyone that watched, um, because why would you do a webinar if no one's going to participate? <laughs> so I think, let me just acknowledge some of the people that I can see in the comments. But um, if we didn't acknowledge you, uh, Verbally now, we still see you and thank you so much. So I see Makwanda's here, Nandi, Lefanolo. Oh my gosh, Indriz. <laughs> <laughs> Linda, Disco Junkies, and Daya, Dr. Maharaswa. Um, we have DJ Raps, we have Karawo, we have Awande, Mandy, and Cecilia, who said, Wow, touched beyond words. So you see, you're making an actual difference. Thank you. Um, and then, yeah, we have Dindu. I know we have Amez. So everyone that made this possible, not just today, not everyone that just supported today, but in our previous web series as well, we appreciate it so much. Um, this is the last one for the year, but we'll be back. We'll be back next year. <laughs> uh, but for now, please do engage with us. Um, engage on social media, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. It's at Uhura Heritage for everything that's the handle for everything um and on that you'll be able to find the, the well this will be on youtube on who heritage's youtube um you'll also be able to engage with the panelists bonola and montati there you'll be able to find their handles um you'll be able to find under pressure um sundays which bonola holds incredible platform so please do check it out <laughs> you'll get to see yeah You'll get to see him when Tati. Um, we're so proud of you. You're going to burn Birmingham. I hope I said yes. that correctly. Yes. Uh, so she has a backup buddy link that you'll find both in our profile and hers. Please let's get her to Birmingham. Let's make it happen. Um, then you can say, you know, an international artist. <laughs> 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 I'm incentivize here. But yes, thank you so much to everyone. Our co founder, this is it, the last push. So thank you so much, guys. And um, this was incredible. Oh, thank you, thank everyone. You. Bye. <laughs> okay. Bye.